National Seniors Strategy, but we're adding one word. It has to be safe, and I'll explain uh, why. As I'm quite fortunate to be your first speakers and that the others are not here yet, so if you get a repeated message, it's not my fault. Uh, we have a seniors population that's growing. That is not news. We have about 5 million Canadians right now that are over the age of 65. It's about 15% of our population. Within the next two decades, they expect it to go up to 25% of Canadian population over 65. So some are panicking. No need to panic because today's 65 year old are a lot healthier than they've ever been. You know, there's a saying, 60s, the old 40s, and it is. Uh, we're seeing 65 years old, 70 years old, still in the workforce. Some it's by choice, some it uh, is not. And I'll let uh, Hassan Youssef talk about those numbers. I'll stick to the healthcare numbers, but a lot healthier. But what we're seeing is the reality is when you get older, there are more comorbidity that you have. So it just means you have more diseases, you take more medication, and sometimes you need help. I've been quoted by saying, I want to be 92 years old driving my car and playing racquetball. And all my friends said, Linda, you don't play racquetball now. I said, yeah, it was in the speech, it sounded good, but we all want to be 92 years old and be very active. The problem is it's not going to happen to everyone. And some of us are going to need help and we will need to save help. And that's what we have to do. As I mentioned, Hassan will be talking about the uh, overall seniors' low income. You've heard a lot about it. 12% of seniors live below the poverty line. If you're a woman and a senior, it's even worse. If you're a single woman and a senior, it's worse. So when your health fails, it's hard, harder for you to provide and to get the care that you need. I don't want to be negative. I've mentioned uh, the 65 year old are healthier, are more active, and are taking charge. The senior population and seniors group are being our biggest advocates for a national prescription drug program. Why? Because they know when they open their purses or when they look in their medicine cabinet, there are many, many drugs in there, prescription drugs, I hope anyway. But they, when they look at the prescription drugs, some of them are wondering, do I need to take all of this? And most of them are under a government-sponsored plan, so they don't need to be paying for it, but they're questioning. My biggest surprise this winter when we were doing research, one-fifth of seniors are taking drugs that are known to be harmful to them. One-fifth, that is scary. So every time you open your purse or you look at your medicine cabinet and you're over 65, am I one-fifth of them? So we need a national uh, prescription drug program. Why? Because yes, it'll reduce the cost across the country, reduce the cost for Canadian families, but it will also provide better prescribing habits and better, uh, uh, more safety for everyone. It is not a silver tsunami as many as uh, have been calling, and I mentioned the going up to 25% of Canadian population. Many economists that can count way higher than me are saying it's about 1% one percent of the increase in healthcare costs. That's what the aging of the population is doing, 1%. Tomorrow morning, and that's why I have to almost eat and run out, we're going to be bringing out a report uh, on healthcare financing, and I want to say uh, your $36 billion will be peanuts compared to what's going to be announced on the shortfall in federal health care funding tomorrow morning. So just saying, you might want to buy a few more balloons, and uh, you will see it by a telegraph, uh, telegraph, is that the newspaper here? Yeah. Telegram. Telegram tomorrow, and we'll have a full page ad uh, to give you a glimpse, and then I'll, I'm sure it'll be all over the media. We have two economists, one very lefty, Hugh McKenzie, who wrote the report, and one, I kind of say, hey, right-wing Kevin Page? No. No. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, you know, still there, both of them are going to come on the same page and uh, announce 
uh, the new $36 billion. So we'll see about that tomorrow. Why did CFNU con uh, commission this report before it's too late a national plan for a safe seniors agenda? Because everyone was calling for a national seniors agenda and nobody was talking about safety. I represent nurses, nurses that work in home care, long-term care, and they say, Linda, this is dangerous. It's dangerous to work in home care. It's dangerous to work in long-term care. We don't have enough staff. We have to realize it takes people to take care of people. You can build all the funny buildings you want in the world, but if you don't have the appropriate staffing, and it goes further than nurses. Nurses are only about 10% of the workforce in long-term care, for example. But you need people and good people with good training to take care of uh, seniors in those situations. And you'll see this in this report uh, very well. You'll also sh sh see that healthcare workers and nurses are sounding the alarm. That if we continue this way, it will get more dangerous in every sector of our uh, country in home care and long-term care. We, one also, you'll find in the report that was quite scary, 90% uh, of seniors are able to live independently, but 96% of them need help. And right now, it is not true home care because it is very scarce <coughs> on how you can get home care services across the country it is through families and friends. And I was shocked to hear that 10% of, where is it so I don't get mixed up in my, I should follow my notes, you know that, eh? <laughs> but about 10% of seniors, uh, of seniors, of families and friends that take care of seniors do it more than 30 hours a week. That's a full-time job. So imagine spending 30 hours a week taking care of a loved one. And they're not asking for uh, to be paid to do it. They're asking for help. Because some will say, oh, it's providing the extended family back. We're going to take care of each other. It's a family. Our grandmothers and our aunts, because it's often left to the women in the family, weren't changing catheters on their family members, weren't giving very complicated medications such as narcotics, to their family members or their uh, their parents. And that's what we're asking our families to do now is very specific <coughs> procedures and very complex procedures that are often, one, not safe, but second, not comfortable. I really don't want to put a catheter in my father, and I'm a nurse. You know, I want to take care of them. I want to make sure that they're okay and they're safe and they're happy and they see their family. But it is not my responsibility to do those kinds of uh, duties. We look at uh, violence in nursing homes. The main reporter in here is uh, Dr. Pat Armstrong from York University. She spent her career and now it's her whole team at York University looking at the working condition in long-term care and the quality of care seniors receive. She's been for the last 10 years working with Nordic <coughs> countries and looking at violence and staffing. In Nordic countries, the level of violence in their country compared to ours, ours is five to six times higher than Nordic country. The number one reason, we don't have enough staff. And I, you know, it's like that popcorn. You know, you put popcorn in boiling oil, the more you put the e heat on, you see there's an H there, the more you put the heat on, the, you, you uh, pop. And that creates the same uh, phenomenon for residents, but also for staff. So it increased violence, it increased bullying, etc. cetera. <coughs> and nursing homes are the worst areas. And we really have to look at our staffing and where we're going with this. Our situation uh, is very uh, scarce everywhere. If we look at uh, hospitals, 14% of seniors who are waiting, 14% uh, of hospital beds are held by seniors that are waiting for other uh, alternate levels of care, which means they're waiting to go home 
uh, in, to get home care or they're waiting for a long-term care bed. 14%. Think of the cost of a hospital bed, which average in the country is about eight, nine hundred dollars a day. Some provinces it's higher, some provinces it's lower. For a long-term care facility, it's $125 a day average. And for home care, it's about $80, to $70 a day, depending on where you're working. But we're keeping seniors there and then wondering why we're having problems with our hospital. We have a sandwich generation. We know it. You've heard uh, bigger experts to talk about it. But we have to work with all the uh, communities and all the groups to make sure that we're talking about a safe seniors agenda and that we're making sure that the uh, services are there for all Canadians. So you will see this report. I brought copies. I'm also asking you, I have, my, my, I have cheat sheets too, uh, because not everyone will read a 40-page uh, report. So we give you a cheat sheet with the uh, statistics that you will need to make the arguments with federal government. In here, it will call for a national uh, strategy on safe seniors care, which means we need national guidelines. Uh, it is the best long-term care facility I ever visited across the country was in the Yukon. In the Yukon. And I visit many, many across the country. Why is it okay for the Yukon and why can't we get the same thing in Ontario or in Newfoundland and Labrador? We have to have standards and the standards have to be based on safety. And these are about staffing. You will see in the report on staffing, the evidence shows you need 4.5 hours of care, uh, of direct care to every residence. The average across con the country is around two hours of care. Uh, some policies say 4.1 hours of care, but the, they can't find enough staff or they don't have enough funding. So we have to look at it. So in on CFNU, you will see voting for care, and it's to put every federal candidate uh, a priority on health care. Now, one party has come up with a platform on health care yet, and we will see if they talk about health care. When I've met with the, uh, the uh, federal leaders, I was blunt. Uh, I said, if you're going to have a motherhood and apple pie national senior strategy, which means oh, we need uh, more exercise program, we need better nutrition, uh, community centers so you can go and entertain uh, yourself and families, and you're not talking about long-term care and home care, we will come and criticize you to the max. Because if our seniors cannot be safe in this country, uh, what is to be expected? agenda and we will work together to get it. The premiers are talking about it. Last year healthcare wasn't even on their agenda. Healthcare is on their agenda in the next two days. We have a breakfast meeting with them uh, tomorrow morning where we brought uh, Hugh McKenzie and uh, Kevin Page to present to them the healthcare financing and the report is called uh, Canada Health Transfer to Disconnect. So when we're talking about the disconnect is the federal conservative government has disconnected themselves from any reasonable discussion in healthcare and of course in healthcare financing and that's why as I say back home in Brunswick we're in deep caca and if we don't <laughs> fix it on October 19, uh, honestly we will get what we uh, deserve uh, so we all have to be active here. And look at his timing. You think he was right on cue. But no, I'm very pleased uh, to be here and that you're here in such uh, great numbers. A big thank you, and Pauline will answer all the questions necessary. <laughs> Speaker.
and he was elected in May of 2014 as the first person of color to lead the country's labor movement, winning a mandate for change to increase activism in response to the challenging needs facing unions. Coming to Canada from Guyana at 16 years old, he trained to be a heavy truck mechanic. He quickly became a union activist with fellow workers, uh, electing him plant chair after he attended just three union meetings. Legendary uh, Canadian auto worker, leader Bob White, soon noticed Yusuf and recruited him to become a senior staff member of CAW, which is now Unifor. He has an uh, impressive work at CAW, led him to be elected as the Executive Vice President of the Canadian Labour Congress in 1999 and as the CLC's first person of color as an executive position. In 2002, he was elected to the first of four terms as Secretary Treasurer and was elected President of the Trade Union Confederation of, of America, TUCA, in 2012 for a four-year term, heading an international labor group representing more than 50 million workers in 29 countries. That's pretty impressive, man. <laughs> 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 I apologize for my tardiness. I was waiting for at least one of the previous to show up. <coughs> so I could at least say two cents for today. Uh, first, uh, uh, let me start by thank you for inviting me here. It's good to be in Newfoundland and Labrador. I always uh, enjoy coming here. See, I was born on the Atlantic coast, so I know anything about living on the Atlantic. You're always good people living on the Atlantic coast. <laughs> Throughout the world, it was the same. It's not just here, by the way. So it's, it's good to be here. I want to thank, of course, uh, my colleagues in the Healthcare Coalition for the work that you do. Um, I wish we were having the kind of discussion you're having here tonight uh, right across this country, because I do believe that if we don't take some necessary steps in the upcoming election, we're going to regret for the rest of our lives what's at stake, and I don't want to tell you how much I despise this rotten government in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. So, I'm in a church, I'm not going to well, I, I've always seek forgiveness for my sins, so. But uh, it is, uh, of course, uh, uh, for everybody that's here, I think this is really a fundamental uh, discussion that we're having here. This city, of course, for the first time, I, I, I with somebody who's a native of Newfoundlander, uh, Rex Murphy, who's a uh, host of Cross Country Checkup, but somebody who says, you're friends with that guy? <laughs> I am, and it's kind of an interesting relationship, like a lot of other relationships I have. And we, you always tell me about, you know, the interesting part of being part of Newfoundland and Labrador, the history of this province. And um, I wasn't born here, so I understand very much when Joey Small moved around this place like an iron fist, and um, he reminds me how much has changed. But fundamentally, I think that um, what has been happening in this city in this province is remarkable. First and foremost, of course, the economic development, the jobs, and of course, the prosperity that are coming, not for all, but this coming is absolutely essential because I think for being New Flanders and Labrador is what this country was all about. You need to be masters of your own destiny and to be in charge of your province and the leaders and the one is created here. So I can't tell you how pleased I am, what has been happening, and more importantly, I just think you need to elect the right government. Tweedle down and tweedle leave is not going to solve our problem. <laughs> You've gone back and forth, maybe this time my friend Earl might convince you that he need to be the next bringer of the <laughs> Your success is not just about Newfoundland or Labrador's success, it's about the success of the entire country. So whatever is happening here, I'm a big believer of it, um, I want to be part of that because I think what you're trying to do here is remarkably important. And it's a small place, everybody knows each other. We can't help it, but it's like the rest of the country. We may have 30-something million people, but we know each other. And I think we need to take some the incredible responsibility about the challenges that we face. Um, of course, it's about time we had a Prime Minister who understand that the challenges we face is not simply going to be solved by sitting on the sidelines. You know, the Prime Minister keep denying that they're supposed to be the fiscal managers. To go over the country with 13 billion all over to surplus and we got the largest debt, and they tell us they're the good fiscal managers. We have to leave them in charge. By the way, you have to announce we're in a recession, but the Bank of Canada just did that today by lowering interest rates. 
if these are good fiscal managers and economic manager of the country, why any idiot can do better than these clowns. So I hope you get the message. Whatever we need to do, we need to make sure that not a single conservative get elected in this province in the next federal election. <laughs> I want to thank the Health Corporation Newfoundland and Labrador, but also the Canadian Health Corporation for the incredible work that they do, because despite what you may think about the importance of healthcare in our country, we've got a lot of work to do. And I'm hoping I could share some of what my thoughts are in the focus of the Congress. Uh, we have made this a priority of this election, because one of the four issues the Congress is campaigning on is healthcare. And it's critical, I think, that we try to focus, because um, if we don't get Canadians to focus on this and get them out to vote in this coming election, we are going to get the results we truly deserve. Um, I, I can go on at length about the federal election, but I'm not going to do that. But it is critical, I think, in, as I travel around the world, we're fortunate for what Tommy Douglas Ray did in this country. I know many of us wasn't there in that period when we had to reach into our pocket to pay for our health care. The reality is I get to travel on, on your behalf uh, around the world see what it's like when people don't have the resources for healthcare. A country right beside us, the United States, they do it every single day. And if you ask American and working families about the challenges they face, their biggest fear is they get sick, and then they go bankrupt. That's the reality. But I think at the same time as we need to think about this and how better we can do with building our healthcare system, and it can't remain the same, by the way. For all the good things we have done, how we have created our healthcare system has to evolve and has to change because the reality is the population is changing, there's new kinds of diseases that we have to treat and deal with that we didn't comprehend 25 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. That's the reality we're dealing with here today. And I think it's critical in that co context that we do need a, long, uh, a senior strategy in this country. I think I've got gray hairs, some of you in this audience will share my burden. You have the same gray hairs I do. And for those of us who are getting older, there are certain cares we're going to require that's going to meet the healthcare system, have to shift and change priority. First and foremost is the fundamental Canadian values of healthcare. It's about fairness and it's about equality. When we get six, we don't have to determine how much money we have in our pocket to get the kind of care. Everyone in Canada is healthcare based on needs, not on wealth. And that is the fundamental principle we have to keep going, despite what Stephen Harper would like to do. That's the reality. And the labor movement has always been part of this fight because we recognize for our members we represent, despite the reality that we're able to get other care that we negotiate, our fundamental values of healthcare in this country is still worthy for us to defend and to fight for because we can make a difference. Our system, of course, costs less than the profit system in the US. We know that statistically, we know that from the research. It delivers better outcome and key indicators of infant mortality far better than most countries around the world, and of course, life expectancy. Hey, for a testament for living older lives in this country will keep getting better because of the better healthcare system we have in this country. Healthcare costs, of course, uh, remain uh, uh, the largest, of course, challenge for the United States on personal bankruptcy. The number one reason Americans go bankrupt is because of healthcare. An incredibly developed country, but yet the reality is they can't come together with the fact they need social medicine in the United States. And Obama tried, I don't think he got it right, and maybe some other future president of the United States will try even harder to get it right. However, of course, our system can operate in autopilot. For nine years, the Harper government has been in office, it's been on autopilot. Not once have they enforced the Canada Health Act in the last nine years, not once. It's a disgrace. Because these are fundamental principles of how we deliver health care across this country. But at the same time, we need to adapt to the challenges of the patient and healthcare system in the country. One of the biggest challenges, of course, is the aging population. Demand will increase, of course, we know the cost will increase in regards to some of the disease we have to train and uh, deal with, and of course, your needs will change. We're going to see a rise, of course, in chronic and complex condition. That's the reality. And healthcare uh, workers, of course, are also aging. Large numbers of retiring are coming in our country. Um, many of us, and all of this will put additional pressures on our healthcare system across the country, that's the reality. We will put more pressures on our hospitals, we will put more pressures on healthcare workers who are already struggling, of course, to deal with the cutbacks and the staff changes. One of the things we don't talk about in this country is 
the workers who are the front line in this country are delivering health care. They understand fundamentally, which many of us don't see, the need to provide care even when they're exhausted. These are people, your friends, your neighbors, who do this every single day. They're the nurses, they're the frontline hospital workers who do this every single day and recognize that the system is busting in some part of the seams across this country. These are major challenges I don't think we can ignore and we have to deal with them going forward. And we do need a national government who are committed to, of course, addressing this. Public policies, of course, should be taken to respond to these challenges because we can't ignore it. Tonight, of course, I want to outline six policy point agenda that is part of our, I think, is critical for us to think about. <clears throat> One, we need to invest more. This is a key uh, in dealing with, of course, the rising cost of ch for the changing needs. The Conservative government, of course, is proposing to cut some $36 billion of the system over starting next year, over the next 10 years. If you think you got prob problems now in Newfoundland and Labrador, think of all those cuts were to take effect. How much more difficult the healthcare system in this country is going to be. I'll let me provide a little bit of a background. Because at this point, the debate will uh, hopefully be a debate in, in the election coming up. In 2004, the provincial government signed a 10-year court that lasted until 2014. I was at the finance minister at meeting in Victoria, and uh, Clarity was still the finance minister they met. It was during the lunch hour, as they were having their lunch hour break, a document was put before the finance ministers. They didn't know what it was the department, but they weren't even told in advance. It was the new health care funding going forward. And I remember some of the ministers were just angry as they quickly read through the document. What is this? The party said, this is not up for debate. It's not up for discussion. This is the new health care formula going forward from this point on. That's the respect the federal government has for the provinces who are the front line delivering health care in this country. That's Shame. what happened. Shame. Shame. It's an absolute Shame. disgrace. I came out there, ministers would just like beside themselves. They couldn't believe what was happening in there. They thought the federal government would say, let's have a meeting to talk about how we can negotiate the health care report. There was no negotiations. There was no discussions. It was simply, here's what it is, because they already figured out they were going to save $36 billion. Harper, no one fundamental thing. He tells Canadians he's going to privatize health care, he will lose the next election. So what does he do? He does it by fiat. He starved the system for money. When we created the system, the federal government promised to provide 50% of the funding for a health care system. Today it's less than 20%, and it'll get to less than 16 some people says to 14% going forward. This is not what the arrangement was. The province needs the support that we can provide, but equally so they need to be challenged. Because yes, they need money, but also need leadership. And the leadership is we can build a better system. Yes, we have to pay taxes. We want to have a better healthcare system in this country. It's not up for free. They're going to increase taxes to provide better health care. They will get the support of Canadians in this country. Because we recognize it's such a fundamental value. It defines who we are in this country. Of course, um, the 2000 election, the Liberals, the New Democrat parties all promised to maintain the 6% calculator beyond 2014. And of course, this will be an important challenge. But after the election, if the Conservative Party won a majority, you know, Stephen Harper is not going to stop at the $36 billion that he's proposing to cut. He will move farther. I said, not once in the last nine years has he enforced the county health act. Not once. If you think, Dr. Day, who's running to become the, I don't know what the, where the election is in BC with the. Um, Lost. Did he lose Lost. finally? Oh, good. Oh. Bastard. Yeah. <laughs> 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 anyway, good things do happen. You can get short. I seek forgiveness. But anyway, long and short, uh, I think that's a good thing. Well, at least we don't have one private yeah. leading the, 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 the medical association in BC. Of course, first, if we've got to get beyond the 6% uh, transfer to the present, pre the, the pre present proposal that Harper government have on there. Secondly, the formula for uh, calculating the amount of transfers is no longer contains an equalization component. The calculator is based on strictly on the population of the province. In Nova Scotia, if they have an aging population, their needs are going to be different. Their cost is going to be different. And I think that there's many other things that we need to take into this factor. This means the province with smaller, more rural, older population like Newfoundland and Labrador will receive even less funding under the Harper deal. <coughs> the combined effort, of course, Harper changes not only with the 
36 billion dollars cut for healthcare over the next 10 years. That number has come from the Parliamentary Budget Office and, of course, the Council of Federation. So, the Infinite Labrador, the loss will be some 491 million dollars for the city of St. John's alone. That's a loss of 173 million dollars. Uh, I want to say that under Harper, health, the, the health care deal that there was 36 million less for health care, the result is a massive cost, of course, in long term wait for services to Canadian needs. And it will be, of course, almost impossible to meet the demands of an aging population. So, the number one thing, of course, we need, of course, in Ottawa is, of course, the government is committed to reversing this, and, of course, the government is committed to defending our health care system. <coughs> Two, of course, we need to expand access to community care. Listen, I have a 91-year-old mother uh, this year. At some point, she's going to go into somewhere to get some support. Without my personal financial support, she can't afford to go anywhere. But every one of you in this room knows somebody who live in that reality. A grandparent or a friend <coughs> or a friend or somebody who's struggling with that reality. I was in summary last week and uh, can I can't see for an NEP candidate. Almost every household I went to were talked with home care. Also, a woman told me she said my husband recently passed away. He was suffering. He's 165 pounds. They sent a healthcare nurse to help him take a bath. She couldn't eat with him. Nurse said she'd have to. She had to do all of this. She said, I'm mentally and physically exhausted. It's absolutely sad and upsetting, but I'm glad my husband died. Because I think I would have been better. First, just having to provide the care that she was providing for her sick husband. Why should that person have to live this reality? This is a disgrace. We live in a first world country. But each one of you know a family that's living that reality. We have more seniors staying in a hospital because the only place they can get their medication for free because we don't have a national pharma care to cover here. I can go on at length, this is butter, but it's critical, I think, in the context of what I'm talking about, it's a reality that you know more often than I do. But I think it's critical, I think, in the context of this election. It's not simply we accept the status quo, we have to change the status quo. And it's critical for us to think about that. Of course, there's 800,000 Canadians who can't get home care service they need right now in our country. 800,000, and that's just going to increase as we go forward. We need a universal prescription job plan. There are more Canadians today that are sick, going to work sick because they don't have the medication to get them better. Why should that happen in a pearl first country? Because patent protection for multinational corporation doesn't deserve it and don't need it. When we should be talking about how do we create a national pharma care program in this country to help working people get the kind of medication they need. That's the reality that we're dealing with today. Of course, you're never going to hear Stephen Harper talk about this. We need to improve access to health care providers across the country. That's another reality we have to deal with. I mean, too often not to hear Canadians talking about they can't get the services they need. I was going through some medical challenges in my life. I didn't have a clue what was going on in my body. So I had to meet this specialist who is an incredible uh, human being. So I had to go get his CAT scan, and he said, so I went to make an appointment. They said, six months, you got to go to the waiting list. So I called him back, and I said, I got an appointment for six months from now. He said, that's absolutely unacceptable. He picked up the phone the next morning. I was told I had a CAT scan at 2.30 at night in the hospital. Just that I happened to have this great individual who was there advocating for me. He got me an appointment just like that. Most people in Toronto was waiting six months to get its cat scan in a hospital. And that's not a unique story. Everybody knows somebody who are waiting to see a specialist or to get some special diagnosis for months to get into the system. Why should that be happening in our country? This is not what we were told about our healthcare system. Of course, we need a federal government that's going to enforce the Canada Health Act. It's critical, I think, in that area that these principles mean something. More important, we also need to yeah, expand the system to include home care and pharma care at the end of the day. I don't think Dr. Day is here tonight. We're doing a thing tomorrow to the Medical Association. But uh, uh, certainly Dr. Dr. Simpson, who is this incredible president of CMA, I've made a friendship with, who 
runs the cardiac divisions in the Kingston Hospital in Ontario. He's a strong advocate of health care. He believes in the system. He fundamentally thinks there's something wrong, and more importantly, we should change it. And him and I have been on this kind of off again, on again, tour across different places, talking about health care. And they've got a senior strategy that fundamentally they're pushing. They said, here are some three things. One of the things he said, we're going to talk about why we need to fix the issue of retirement security in this country. Because if seniors don't have decent income, how can they have proper nutrition to look after themselves at the end of the day? And he's a big supporter of the expanded Canada Pension Plan because it fundamentally says that when people retire in this country, they have decent income so they can buy good food and they can remain healthy in our country. So that has to be part of it. Because I think it's fundamental. We also need, of course, to deal with the social determinants of health. I have said a long time ago, we spend too much of our time talking about what we do with people when they're sick, or how we prevent them from getting sick in the first place. One of the most fundamental things, we need social housing in this country. We have too many of our citizens who can't afford to live in a decent place because they can't pay the rent and we don't have enough social housing in this country. I know a, a long-term strategy for us is not simply to accept health care as it is in our country. It's to how we improve it, how do we change it, how do we deal with the realities we're faced with. I think these six points are critical. There are many other issues I know many are going to have, but I think in this election, and I'll say this and conclude, this is a fundamental opportunity for all of us. I fundamentally believe we can defeat this rotten government in Ottawa. But all of us are going to have to take some personal and political responsibility to go out and advocate to ensure that this government does not get re-elected. It's not just simply here in St. John, Newfoundland, and Labrador, but it's right across the country because Canadians recognize to a large extent what is happening in our country, how much it has changed under this Harper regime. And more importantly, if they get another mandate, they are going to make some things irreversible for the future. We can't fail our kids and our grandkids in this country. If we do, it's an absolute disgrace. Because if you look at what our four parents fought for, that we're still living under, this is our moment to redefine this country, that we can arrange the agenda and make this country progressive, fair, and just for all Canadians, not just the wealthy, because the wealthy will always have health care. They'll get on an airplane and fly out of the country and get service. We don't get the luxury of leaving our community because we can't afford it. This is our moment to redefine our country to say, listen, these things matter to working people. And by God, we can afford a first start health care with all the services we deserve. So we can grow it, we can expand it, and more importantly, we can make it that better for the next generation in this country. This is our moment to ensure we do our part to ensure that the rotten government does not remain after October 19th. Thank you so much. Yeah. Get one of these, and not only are you going to get one, but you're going to get three or four and hand them around. 
because we have got to be proactive. Now, the other thing you can do is join the Newfoundland Laboratory Health Coalition. We're free. You don't have to pay anything. As a matter of fact, sometimes we pay you because we feed you. So, join the Newfoundland Laboratory Health Coalition. See me. I can take your name and your information and get you on the list. Right now, the coalition is made up mainly of unions, uh, which is great because that represents thousands and thousands of people. We have some women's organizations, we have pensioners, some seniors groups, some individuals. So sign up and become part of the proactive to try and keep our health care. Now, I'm not a public speaker. Normally when my mother sends me out the door, I got a little disclaimer stuck on my back that she is not responsible for what I'm about to say. <laughs> and the health coalition is not responsible for what I'm about to say either. But what I'm going to say is that this is a time, like never before, that we have got to start doing something. Um, when you're saying like about family members and things, like I'll just tell you about my aunt. Now my aunt was rich, and I don't know how come that never translated to us, because we're not. She must have been on the other side of the family. I don't know how it worked. Anyway, when she was looking for home care, she went to a private uh, home care place in the city and paid out of pocket for her home care because she was hoity-toity and that's where she wanted to go. And we didn't mind telling her that she was hoity-toity because the public system just wasn't good enough for her because that's where everybody else was. She had to have something special and something better because that's always the way. The only thing was she lived longer than what she thought she would. She lived over 20 years in that home at over $5,000 a month. $5,000 a month at over 20 years is $1.2 million. That is what she paid for private care. You pay for it, and it's your money, and it's gone. When she ran out of money, her kids then, my cousins, not so hoity toity, but they, had, they went then and they lobbied government so that she could stay in this private home rather than going into the public system and wanted government to pay for it. And she made a racket and they kicked up and they kicked up and they kicked up and they won. They had government pay the private care fee for her to stay in that home. Which again, that's not government's money, that's your money, that's my money. That's our tax dollars keeping her in that private home. So we have to say, forget the privates because we see where that goes. And not only that, but towards the end of it, when she had, the all, uh, had Alzheimer's and started wandering the floors and the rest of it, there was no one there to help her from injuring herself. So she didn't even in the private home get the care she should have had. So we need to keep it public, publicly funded, publicly delivered. And it's got to be there for when I'm old. Because see, a parent's longevity is in the family. <laughs> so I want to be there. My mother's 83. And she, like, I can't keep up with her. She goes to Walmart, and she's gone. <laughs> and we meet up at the cash register, because I don't know where she goes. But anyway, um, the longevity is there. Now, when Dad was sick, and Dad had Alzheimer's, she didn't put him in a home, because she said she wanted to take care of him at home. But I think she didn't put him in a home, because she was afraid she would lose her house and her money. And she was unfair, but if he went in a home, she'd have to pay for part of it, then she would have nothing to live on. Because as soon as dad died, there was half her income gone with his, with his money. So we have got to start saying to government and saying to the politicians and saying to whoever is around, whoever will listen, that this has to be done and done right and changed now. Because we do have an aging population. But we do have an economy that has to be managed better and, and taken, you know, just taken better care. It's not the fact that we don't have the money. It's just that the money is not managed right. And that's half the problem. And, uh, you know, it's the same thing. Like, th and that's my story for just one example. I've got a dozen, but, you know, I'm going to let you out of here soon. But, like, I was today, and I'm listening to the POC and Open Line, which everybody knows. That's where you got to listen. <laughs> and uh, listening today, just on the radio today, and one lady phoned in, and she was saying she worked in a private uh, home. And she was saying that she couldn't believe how much over-prescribing of drugs were given to sedate patients because they didn't have enough staff to look after them. Shame. Shame. And you know what? That happens every day, all day. Happens every day.
happening everywhere. And these, these things have to stop. Another woman phoned in and she said, I worked in a private home. I was hired as a cleaner. I worked at that for a while. I could do that. I knew how to clean. She said, and after a while, they came to me and said, we're short staffed. Would you mind working in the kitchen? She said, yeah, I didn't mind doing that. I knew how to cook and I could clean, cook and clean, and that was fine. Then she said, they were short staffed again, and they made me a runner. And buddy goes, well, what's a runner? And she said, well, a runner. You know, when, when a nurse needs help or another staff member needs help, you go and help them. So if the patient needs to get out of the bed, you help them get out of the bed. Now, she said, I did it, but I was nervous because I didn't really know how to live. Now, I'm going to be the one needing home care, you know, you hurt yourself. And so she stayed out for a while. Then she said, the straw that broke the camel's back is when they came to her and said, you have to now go around and give out the drugs to the clients. And she said, now hang on, I'm in no way qualified to do that. And they said, well, you don't need to worry about it because they're all in blister packs, everybody's name's on it, you give it to them, and that's the way it is. But what happens when it comes in a blister pack and two drugs interact, and the person giving out doesn't know that. Now, I'm not a nurse. Don't know anything about it. Don't even go to a hospital. Stays right out. But I would know that unless you do what the drug was, you don't get it. You don't take it unless you know what it is. That's just sensible. Right? But she finally said, I had to get out of there because I'm not going to be giving up drugs. And she said, and they just expected that that was my job. So that was another story. And uh, then another lady called in, and she said that her mother was in uh, a public long-term uh, care facility, the new one, apparently. And she said, when I'm not there, I never worry about the care she's receiving. She said, when I can't be there, she's taken care of above and beyond. And you know what? The public system does that. We have good quality care in the public system. The workers there know what they're doing, they're trained to do it. Um, so that was just a few things that I wanted to say. And then the other thing that, about the drugs, has anybody heard that commercial on the radio lately where they shake the, the pill bottle, save your drugs, and then they go, we have collected over 40 tons of medication. 40 tons! Like, do you know how much that is? I mean, that is a lot of wasted money, a lot of pills, and it's just crazy. They had uh, a thing here at the, at the uh, Newfoundland Vestabulary a few weeks ago. They collected 20,000 old pills. We were wondering why there's no money for drugs. Well, if you've got 20,000, you can just flush away. I mean, that's crazy. And some of them are 3 $4 a pill. So we've got to start being more informed. We've got to start even sometimes holding your doctor accountable to say, okay, why are you giving me this? What is this for? So we've got to start being more proactive and start working on, on some of these things to try and get our um, care, get our, our pharma care on the road, on the right road, get our politicians to listen to us and be proactive. So join the Newfoundland Labrador Healthcare. And thank you very much for coming. There's some coffee and cookies down in the back and some fruit, so help yourself. Oh, anybody want a question? Yes. Anybody got a question? Yes, sir. Question over here. And Kevin, Council Canadians, uh, just to, to say to, to you, I totally agree that Harper is the bane of our existence here. He's the one that set up the human out of the formula. Let's not leave our premiers and our ministers of education or ministers of health out the hook because they came in the Harper. And I haven't heard, certainly the premiers, I don't know how many we've had here in the province in the last six or seven months, two or three different premiers, I haven't heard either one of them stand up and say to Harper, sign a health accord, give us more money. I haven't heard one minister of health in this province stand up for health care. So let's not let our premiers get off the hook here and our ministers. And the question I was going to ask is, the stra strategy is what you're talking about here. Uh, I know we have two MPs here. Uh, from our province in the House of Commons. I wouldn't want to, one, one of them to speak on the matter of a lost vote in the House of Commons on a national dementia strategy. Because when we're talking about seniors' care, we all know the looming crisis in terms of the increase in dementia that's coming to this province and to this country, in fact, the entire world. So I would like if one of our MPs could comment on what exactly happened to that particular, I think it was a private member's resolution on a 
has setting up a national dementia strategy. Brian, you want to take that? Or Jack? We had, a, uh, we had a vote in the House of Commons on a uh, national dementia strategy. And uh, we um, thought we had the, uh, we thought we, we would do it, that we'd actually win the vote. And we had the, um, we had the word from the liberal leaders, that uh, the leaders of their caucus, that they'd support the, the vote on, um, on the dementia strategy. So lo and behold, the vote was held, and we lost by one vote. And uh, I got on the radio after. I don't usually go after my fellow uh, members of Parliament, Newfoundland and Labrador, even though they're from different stripes. I don't, because we've got a small okay. crowd. Yeah. I'll leave that to Jack. <laughs> because we got a small crowd and we got to get along. But um, I made a point to go on the radio with this because Yvonne Jones, who spent six years in the provincial legislature, she was in her seat but did not vote because she wasn't paying attention. And we lost the dementia. Uh, we lost the dementia votes. But I can tell you that after October 19th, when we win the government, uh, I'm sure that'll be back on the floor of the House of Commons. And I'll give her a poll to make sure you wait. yet from uh, anyone, and pre presumably there isn't anyone with sufficient uh, medical uh, uh, education. So perhaps there's a doctor in the house who can explain to us why we haven't heard more public discussion about the medical benefits of cannabis and endocannabinoids, and how far are we from getting universal access to cannabis, medically prescribed cannabis. Is there a doctor in the house, not a politician? No doctors in the house, sir. But we'll try to see if we can find out some answers to that. Is that a question there? Uh, well, I don't know. But yes, it is a question. Do no comment? Uh, Go ahead. Because I, uh, I mean, I've worked in, in the system for quite a number of years. And in the last 10 years, I had the unfortunate experience of having relatives in the personal care homes, and home care, the nursing homes, both public and private. And I can tell you it is one hell of a time, especially when you've got maybe two or three at the same time and you're trying to deal with them. Um, and at this time, I spend most of my time in, in the, the health system helping people get through the system or answering questions from people who have relatives in the system, especially the long-term care system. They are really, really stressed out. And when you're up against problems, when you've got a relative in the system, you don't have the energy to take on the system. You're just focused on trying to get your relative through it the best way you can. So at this time, I believe that it's time that we have a, a uh, consumer health advocate group and I would certainly be willing to be part of that. And, and, I, and, and, and this is a group that can help people on the ground level. If they have a problem in, in a health care institution, they got some number they can call. That, because what the, you know, they're really not treated that well when they complain about the care that their relatives are getting. So if there was, if there was some group that could be with them and talk to them. And that way you could teach, that teach or help them get the issues continually in the news media. And you could also address the, the most blatant um, omission in the system right now, which is, I mean, government's main role is policy and regulations. And because we do not have the appropriate staff ratio for patients. It's, it's lack of regulations by the government. And there's not one government standing up saying that they will review the despicable regulations that's in place. Ever since the, the fire that we had here in the province that we lost 25 lives, big hooray, and they talk about all the standards that we all they put in place was building standards. There was not one standard for care addressed. 
So we do not have any more standards of care right now in the province than we did 50 years ago. I mean, and so this way, I mean, like, if there was a consumer advocacy group to deal with things like on a daily basis to help people, and you would only need, uh, I mean, I don't think it would take that much, you know, to have that in place and, 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 and to give people some support. I, I mean, like every day you hear people so stressed out and they're dealing with this alone. And, and there's no one, like the regulation should address the, the staff ratio between what's in, what's in the building and, and the, the patients. I mean, that's deplorable. Then there's the ratio of qualified staff. You know that personal care homes do not, any across Canada, do not require anyone with any qualification to be in that home. Nothing. Nothing. Can you believe, I mean, having, having, and you go in those homes, if there's a tag on people, it says nursing staff. You know, we have a big private uh, nursing home. And you go in, and it's, it's on everybody's uh, tag, it's, it's a name, and it says nursing staff. Now, how many are going to question them to find out about that? There's not. But you've got one, and the regulations, I mean, one registered nurse for the whole bloody building. That's right. You have a licensed practical nurse for two floors, and they give out and they give out the, the, the medications. Now, who is giving the care? That's right, and that's some of the stories I was saying that I heard about today. So, let's take that and see if we can get one started. Well, you if, get some people to sign up for the health coalition, and we can start working on something like that. No reason we can't. Well, no, no, the, the health coalition. I I gone down that road in in. in, in calling and talking to people from the Not well, no, we, we discussed maybe, that earlier, do you think you're another one. Maybe there's another one. Yeah, but the health nice. coalitions is the coalitions of all the groups. I'm talking about a, a health advocacy consumer <coughs> group yeah. that and you got a number for a person to call and, and they can say, Yeah, you're right. They yeah. shouldn't be doing that. You know, like the lady who called me her husband was in one of the, the, the public nursing homes. Like public and private, you know, it, 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 it's a fine line there because they're all working under the same regulations. Yeah. So the main place to get to is the regulations that govern care. Okay, well let's see after this we'll meet and see if we can get something, see what we can do and see if there's some people willing to yeah. help with that. Well that's what okay. needs to me. All right, thanks very much. You know, yeah. that's the duty of an RN. When they're trained, yes. it's to advocate for people who are too weak to advocate for themselves. And since they have lost the positions of so many RNs, this is why patients are left in that position. Families are weakened, the patient is weakened, and there's no one to fight for them because there's it's come to the bones, that's right. There, there has Absolutely. to be a certain um, education to being able to advocate what is it their need is. Is there a number where social workers have gone up to the services and have gone down and they have been hit more of a budget? Because nurses, I know as someone who had to go to the day, if it wasn't for the nurse, then what a person I was going through, not like all professions are, you know, where everybody in the profession is that, there certainly needs to be somebody who's going to pick up the social workers and the mistreatment that they have given to some. You know, some people can build the same good stories on how they, you know, manage to get them through, but then when you start talking to those people, it's because they have a family connection to someone or something. If not, they would have been out of that move all together, and that's a huge, huge problem, and that should be a lot of money. Like she just mentioned, she had to ask you if you were in the coalition. There's so many organizations mm -hmm. that are too confusing. It and is. it's got to stop. Now that 211 thing that everybody's talking about, that needs to, why can't that happen here and right now? Because you need to pick up the phone and walk out there. Half of it needs to go. They don't need government funding. That needs to go to people. It needs to be better spending going on. We should be going to Harper with the health care 
reduction plan, a cost-effective reduction plan? Because how many people do you talk to that would say, if government, if I had the money that government spent on this family, I would have been better off? Mm -hmm. A lot of people. Mm -hmm. And that's like some people that are going into the hospitals that go, they should be getting paid for that. If they're going to go visit that elderly person, they should be taking care of that person right next to them, too. And that should be a job. There's all kinds of ways that we can streamline things with common sense because empathy is the best child care. And, and that's what we've got to get back to. Yep. Compassion. Absolutely. We got to. So we are, we're just going, we just got time for two more questions now, and then we're going to call it a wrap. We've got one here, and then we've got one over there. I come from health care. I worked in health care for 34 and a half years. And the problem with health care is that the feeling, the compassion is gone out of health care. And the problem is we have all these management who decide they're going to change everything around. So you go to Ontario, you go to Saskatchewan, you see this model of care and that model of care. So the newest model of care in our long-term care homes now is the Ottawa model. They forget to check with those groups to see how those models are working. Because if you go back, those models are no longer working and they've moved on to another model of care. So the teamwork in healthcare is gone. You talk about your parents. My mother was 84 years old. She fell down and broke her, her hip and I said to, to them, Get her walking five steps and I'll take her home. I'll take care of her, I'll have home care come in. No bur burden to government, I'll take care of her. Thank God I was in a position where I could pay for it. They didn't do that. They decided that my mother was gonna have to go into long-term care. I'm an only child. I left the day that I was supposed to sign the papers for her to go into long-term care. I'm from Cornerbrook, I headed out here. I wouldn't sign the papers. I didn't have, I guess I was coward. I wouldn't sign the papers. The next day my daughter called and said, Mom, Nan is after having a bleed. Well, needless to say, I was back to Cornerbrook. By Wednesday she had died. And you know the, the words that I used when my mother died? Thank you, Jesus, for taking her. So now she don't have to go into long-term care. And I'm a, I'm a health care worker. And it's not because of the treatment she would have received. They're just too short staff. Absolutely. Yes, Absolutely. you can say the ratio is there. The ratio is not there. And when you look, look at public and private, well, one time public had level one, two, three, and fours. Public don't have level ones and twos anymore. All we have is level threes and fours. And I'm willing to say they're up to five and six, but government don't recognize them anymore. So if we put it back where it was a teamwork, no discipline is any more important than the other one. Healthcare is a wheel. And with every wheel, there's spokes. You break any of those spokes and the wheel won't work properly. So we need every spoke working and we need every department working and we will get our health care back to where it should be. Everybody working as a team. Thank you for that. And I'm right, it's getting a, bit, a little bit disjointed, but we've got to try and get it back. This is what I'm saying. We're now at the reactive mode again. We need to do it the proactive. Okay, we've got one time, one more over here. Yep. That's you. I'd just like to say that this lady was very disgruntled with the care. I, I can I can sympathize and empathize with her and everything else, and I can see where she's coming from. But if you've watched any documentaries from W5 where they did really good research on the public uh, 3P situations, my lady, if 3P comes in here to Newfoundland, you ain't seen nothing yet. I also feel that our government, the PC government, not federally now, I'm talking, well, that's pretty bad, but I'm talking about the provincial. The provincial have been like slugs. They've done nothing with our health care or our education systems. 
there's been so much money squandered while they've been cutting back on the staffing in long-term care homes. The other thing is, they're called long-term care. They used to be nursing homes. Long-term care is a title from up along the mainland. Yeah. Now, when we as Newfoundlanders think of long-term care, we think of our senior citizens and old-aged homes. Well, that's not what long-term care is. Right. Long-term care is anybody who cannot be home and need care. They can be any age. They can be from your Newfoundland, uh, the yeah. Queen's Penitentiary. They can be from anywhere. And if they need care, that is long-term. They go into a long-term care home. We do not have nursing homes. I can, I'm 70. I could, something could happen to me tomorrow. I could end up in a long-term care home. Five years from now, I'm only 75. There could be somebody at the Queen's Penitentiary who could be a very violent person, but just wasn't given the two years to send him up federally. He can be across the hall from me in this long-term care facility. So these are terms. The other term that has changed is resident. There was nursing homes and they were lived in by residents. You were a resident there. Now, terminology is a very important thing. Some 10 years ago, the, the word resident was gradually being changed to client. How many clients do you have to deal with today? Now, we can answer back how many residents. A resident is somebody who's living there depending on you for care and compassion. It's their home. She's not a client. She's not paying me to look after her. The government is. She's not paying, she's, and, and this is the way it works. A client to me, if I was out selling uh, house insurance and I'm getting a policy done, you're my client. Call me any time when you beat up your car. <laughs> so a client and a resident is two different things. Uh, uh, a nursing home and long-term care, two totally different things. 3P and publicly funded, totally, totally different things. And what our government has done has whittled away on staffing so much that people like this lady here could be so disgruntled with the public system that she'll actually vote for a 3P because she's desperate. Well, this is, that's the whole thing. We've got to start. So, we've got to start with more information to people, more getting out and learning. And the same with this man asking about the cannabis. It is time for some of our provincial politicians to get on their feet because there's people out there for medicinal reasons and boy, oh boy, they don't have the money to pay for that now. And they could grow their few bucks and they do just what they wanted. The, the other stuff got different stuff in it. It's another game. Okay, well thank you very much. It's all very informative and I think we can go on for hours, but we're gonna call a, a halt to it now. Um, but we're gonna try to meet again in another month or so. and. Uh, and so we've got our politician here right now. They have a blank check for town hall meetings at any time as long as it's nonpartisan. So Jerry, Ryan, and the other fellow back there, Jack, swung his hand and then the gentleman who is ahead of the unions and has power over him, who whistled towards Jack and herded himself over, which I had met last night and had a weak handshake and I grabbed him by the side when I got a picture taken because his hand and he's the head handshake was so weak when I first met him. When he went back there, we can get them to start paying for town halls because you know what? You might want to shut it down, but there's not enough people coming here because you're not letting them speak long enough. 
people are not getting excited because they don't think or don't know or not educated enough to be able to say that they can make a change prior to the election. I don't want you elected. I want it done now. And this can happen. You've got to push these MPs to hold town halls and make sure you get that commitment and don't break down. And it does not cost them any extra money. But we can make it all party, Jerry's work, to make sure all of the politicians are there so everybody's on the same page prior to the election so you know what you're getting. Because if you get the liberals in there, you don't know what it is that they might do. And anybody, Harper, I could paint him as a genius by making sure that uh, things are going to be played at a wordplay pivotal point where all of the words that everybody's upheaving about, he would be able to step in and say, well, that's exactly what I had to do because that's why we had to cut the CBC. Because the moment that you watch in-house committee or the House of Commons, you lose all respect for the media. Our country's taken over. It's time for you people to start rising up and getting something done. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay. Anyway, one more thing I'll say before you go is there's always research and there, there are lots of studies out there. So if you want more information on free fees or anything else, go research. Thank you.